Hi everyone, this is Brian Hayes and welcome to episode 7 of the Music Mind podcast. If you're a fan of feel-good music and of the saxophone like I am, sit back, relax and enjoy a conversation with my very special guest. This lady has reached the top of the Billboard jazz charts in America with a number one single, Serendipity. And you'll get to hear that. She's also toured the world and been on the same performing bill as some of the the greatest artists in the world. As well as that, she's a stunning visual artist, a painter of the highest note. Please enjoy with me my conversation with the wonderful Pamela Williams. Well, hi, Pamela, and welcome to Episode 7 of the Music Mind Podcast. It's a real thrill and honour to have you as my first female guest on the podcast series to date. Okay. (laughs) Hi, Brian. It's nice to be here, and thank you for inviting me to do this. Thank you. So our audience have just heard this fantastic new single that you've just released called Stone Cold. Can you tell us a little bit about this song, how it came about? the process you use to get to what is absolutely a world-class end result. It's just an amazing song, but every aspect of that recording, I'm absolutely blown away with. It's just wonderful. Tell us about it. What's the story behind Stone Cold? Okay. (laughs) Well, I had a nice um, number one hit on Billboard with my last single, which was Serendipity. And I knew that I wanted to release another single the following year. I mean, the years go by so fast. I'm like, oh, it's been a year. I haven't released anything. So um, I got into the studio at around, I started working on it in like June. And, you know, I was messing around with it. And I'm like, what do I do next? I have to you know, have something as interesting as the last one. (laughs) Yeah. And so, yeah. And so I just, I started working on, just some 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 things in my studio and I, I just had this groove and I was thinking this could be something I'm, I'm liking where this is going and so I put it aside um I'm out in California for some reason everybody wanted to come visit me from the east coast okay. <laughs> so everyone came out weather the weather yeah maybe, yeah, yeah the weather <laughs> and so what happened is it just pushed me back on my time frame to get uh, the single out and yeah. so After everybody left, I knew I wanted to release it in late September, October, the latest. And so everyone left and I'm thinking, okay, I have my summer fun. Now let me get myself together, get back in the studio, work on the song and get serious. So So, so (laughs) Um, as as a composition, is this something you're you're the composer or was there collaborations on the song? Who composed it? Yes, this is is interesting. So um, I started the track and... A friend of mine who wrote something um, years ago on like a couple of my CDs when I was signed to Shanaki, he did a song that I like called A Jam for Pam. And I I love his writing. And so I called him. I said, listen, I'm working on this track. Um, Why don't we collaborate on this? You know, you give me some of what you have. And so um, 
you know, he actually didn't hear what I did. He didn't hear my arrangement at all. He just, he just said, Hey, I got some stuff that I've been working on. I'm going to send it your way. <laughs> wow. And so yeah. when I listened to what he sent me, I said, this is interesting. I said, it almost sounds like it goes with what I, I was working on. He hadn't heard what I was working on. The mm. song was in the same key. Yeah. <laughs> it wow. was the same exact tempo. Yeah. And it had that little slide in the family stone kind of groove. And he really, all he did was basically have that one groove though. And I was like, well, I need some more changes in the song. It needs a bridge. It needs some other mm. stuff, but I like that groove he's doing. Mm. So when I put them together in the session, it was like magic. And I use, so what I use, I use what he did for like the second bridge and like the little solo section of the song. And okay. it just, it just kind of came together. Like it was, it was wonderful. They just kind of, it was a marriage and we didn't even know. I didn't tell them keys or anything. I was like, just, just send me something that you've been working on. Isn't but that that's, in, that's yeah. the result. You may well be the greatest storyteller on the saxophone that the world is yet to fully discover. I love the oh, way, wow. the way you tell stories with your music is such a, a breath of fresh air. Oh, so, thank you. so recording it, the quality of the recording is just through the roof. Is that done in your home studio or at a, a professional external studio? In my home studio. You're sitting surrounded by some equipment that anyone can buy. And the, to, to think that the end result of Stone Cold is done in your home <laughs> studio. Isn't that, it's amazing, isn't it? it isn't is it? utterly amazing. It is, it is absolutely amazing. Such a credit, I guess, to your ears. Did you work with a producer? Did you have some independent set of ears to say, oh, I think the bass needs to be a little bit thicker? Or is that all your decisions, the audio decisions? Most of it, yes, was mine. Wow. And, um, yeah. And I did it like right where I'm sitting and I did it all right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, yeah, I pretty much produced the whole track. I, my, the keyboard player sent me his groove. I added, it was very, it was very raw. It was just, it was just like a basic drum beat and mm. keyboards. And he had that wonderful oral, organ solo that I loved. Oh, and, yes. And so, and he oh. had a good, and he had, what he sent me, his section of the song had a cool bass line. And so, mm. I just pretty much went with that synth bass. And mm. I know a lot of times in smooth jazz, they want to have a real bass, but the synth, the bass synth gave it so much funk. It, and it's, I left that. Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> what, what I love about it is how everything sits in the mix. Nothing sticks out. The tenor sax sound is absolutely gorgeous. And uh, I know you originally came from Philadelphia. Is yes. that right? Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk about your early background a little bit later. One of the greats of the tenor sax, Stan Getz, came from Philadelphia, was born in Philadelphia. And there's, there's uh, and I know probably your hero, Grover Washington Jr., <laughs> came there. Absolutely. And I sort of hear in your tenor, I absolutely hear it as you, but I hear a little bit of a mix between Grover and Stan Getz, that beautiful warm sound on tenor, but with your, absolutely with your own ideas. But I guess it's a... It's not a bad compliment to say, you know, that Stan gets and, and Grover yeah. Washington are <laughs> deeply in your sound. So, hey, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, oh. that is a wonderful compliment. Yeah. And uh, you know, what's ironic is tenor has not, re as you probably know by now, and if you went back to a lot of my recordings, they're yes. mostly alto sax and then soprano necks. Yes, and I did a few recordings back back in the day when I first started on tenor. Yes. Um, but alto has been my main thing. Tenor has not been my main instrument. And so that makes me feel nice that you're saying that about the tenor. Because, you know, when you're, you're comfortable in one instrument, that's your thing. You know, when yeah. you pick that horn up, you can, you know yes. what to expect from it. And yes. I, I'm, I've been a little leery with the tenor because I'm like, it's, it's, it's basically, once you can play one sax, you can play all of them, but it's still a different feel. Oh, to I totally tenor. agree. I have become a, a massive fan of you. I'm probably, I'm probably your greatest Australian fan ever at the moment. I think I've just about got all of your albums. I started out by thinking, oh, look, I'd love to do a, a podcast with Pamela. I better get a couple of tracks, you know. So those yeah. couple of tracks become a couple of albums. Okay. And, and, I, and now I'm thinking, wow. I love the way you play. And, and one of the things I do love about the way you play is that you have a different personality and a different sound on those three saxophones. A lot wow. of people, when they grab the soprano, sound like, okay, if they're an alto player, they sound like, okay, they're on a different, it's got a different pitch and it's a different tone, but it's the same player. But I don't know whether you've ever thought of that, but you on tenor, 
actually sound like another personality's hopped in there. It doesn't. Oh, interesting. Act, yeah, it doesn't sound like <laughs> the one, and that's a good thing. Yeah, cool. Because it's yeah. the one music. I like mind, that. <laughs> yeah, it's the one music mind, but it's not like oh, I'm just going to double on another instrument now. And because I have been listening to you a lot over the last week or so, for the first time in my life, and I'm interested to ask you this question, do you think the saxophone is gender independent or is there a female voice on the saxophone compared to a male voice? Have you ever thought of that? Is Do you think the saxophone <laughs> has? Yeah. Tell, talk about that because I've never thought of it well, before. I've largely well, listened to male saxophone players all my life. Sure. And, you know, it, that's an interesting question because I think I've asked myself that question <laughs> as well. And there, there, there's so few of us that play saxophone um, that on the one hand, if you close your eyes and you listen, you won't be able to tell whether it's a man or a woman playing. And I've heard people tell me that they're like, mm. you know, they're so used to hearing men play the saxophone, but they're like, you know, you play like a man, you know, and I think that, yeah. um, it definitely requires strength um, to put the wind into that instrument. Mm. But I think that maybe women, because we're maybe a little bit more subtle in areas, we might have another, like a softer approach, maybe. Maybe we don't always play so hard. <laughs> one, well, one thing, one thing that I absolutely admire about your playing is you've got a really good command of your instruments and you'll just subtly drop in some altissimo notes beautifully in tune with a gorgeous tone, but but rapidly walk away from them. And I think the the male alternative is, yeah, I'm going to hit a screamer, and I'll, I'll just hang, I'll hang on to that screamer for ten hours until the crowd gives me a point. But in your there's this delicacy in the way you approach the altissimo register that the untrained ear wouldn't know you're even playing way up above the range of the instrument. I think I do that more live in a live scenario than yes, even like on a record. I've done it. You're right. I've, I've touched on doing it, but mm. it's not a lot because I'm thinking I don't want people to listen to it and it's too much on a recording so that it's, up. you know what I mean? So I go up there and I just do a couple of little things and I come right back down. <laughs> but, but, but like I'm saying, actually, you do it so musically <laughs> and melodically that if you weren't a saxophone player, you would not in any way think, oh, you know, wow. I want to take you back 26 years now. And that's easy to say, but that's a long time in, in a lifetime, 26 mm -hmm. years. When you recorded a song called Saxtress, as a, as, a, as, as a song which became an album and you do brand yourself as the first lady of saxophone which I love I think that's a marvelous marketing line and I think your business is even saxtress enterprises or something mm -hmm, my take your mind <laughs> back 26 years and mm -hmm. and tell us about what it was like recording that tune and how it's changed how you think you've changed as a musician, when, you know, you've just released Stone Cold, and I know it's on a different horn, mm -hmm. but talk about what it was like back in 1996 when you released your first commercial recording under your own name. Wow. So 1996, Saxtress, I was signed to Heads Up Records at the time. Um, and, of course, the song that you're talking about, that was the title track of the CD, and um, when I heard the track, it was written by a guy who was actually pro who produced the album and who wrote the song called, his name is Mark, Martin Walters. And so he gave me, he's like, I know you're, you like to have these edgy, almost R&B kind of grooves to, to mm. some of what you're doing. Because on, this, on the CD, it was a nice mixture of everything. I even had a, a song that sounded like a, a Latin influence song. I had even a remake of a country Western song. So the CD had a nice variety of different types of songs. And so when I heard that track, I was like, yeah, that's very gritty. It's got that little edge and that R&B mm. flavor. And so I immediately fell in love with the song. And when I listen to it now, <laughs> it's kind of like, I wish I had done some stuff different. Like you're right. When you grow as a player, because some of the stuff on, on that solo on that track, I'm, I don't really like some of the stuff that I did. And I'm like, I wish I had left that out. My approach now would have been to do something completely different. But that's what happens. You you know, yeah. you grow. If I had to sum up what I think of your recordings, they're full of space. They're full of groove, melody, harmony, and love for what you're doing. You can hear it.
Okay, Pamela, I want to take you right back now, right back to the very beginning. What's your first memory of you becoming interested in music? When did you first catch the music bug for, for want of another term? Mm, uh, I would say I had to be in fourth grade. Okay. Uh, I tried to join the band. They had a little Christmas show. And so they, I wanted to play the violin. And so I go into the music room and they said, okay, well, what would you, what are you interested in? And I was like, um, I don't know. Uh, how about the violin? You know, <laughs> yeah. I just knew I wanted to be a musician. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. they said, well, I'm sorry, sweetie, all the violins are taken, but the only thing we really have left is a set of bells, you know, the little bells, the little color bells, oh, okay. the little yeah. miniature xylophone yeah, that you carry yeah. around. Yeah. And so I was like, they're like, they're like, I'm sorry, we were out of everything. What about that? And I was like, okay, just give me that. And I was happy. You know, I remember sitting up on stage when my mother came to the little performance and I'm playing. I thought that was the greatest thing, playing the little bells with the mallets. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's my very first memory. And, and I also had a babysitter at the time. Yeah. Um, so my parents got home a little bit later than when I got let out of school. So we, this is wonderful lady down the street. She had a piano in her house. And I was like, can I play on your piano? And so she was nice enough to let me play her piano. And she noticed that I could play melodies. And she said, ah, you've, have you ever had piano lessons? And I said, no, I'm, no, this is the first time I'm actually playing a piano. And so she was like, you, you got a really good ear. You should, you know, let me give you, she was also a piano teacher. She was like, you should, let me give you some lessons. And so yeah, I think at the time I was like, yeah, okay. But I, I, I never took the lessons. And so, but I loved every day I go, she let me play on her piano. And I saw, I fell in love with the piano and junior high school. Um, I tried to join the band in junior high school. I'm like, I just feel that I'm, I'm supposed to be a music. I'm a musician. I am. I love music so much. I, that's, you know, I spend most of my time listening to music all the time. So um, when I went to, to go to the band director, he says, I'm, you, have, you, already, you already know how to play something. And I said, not really. I'm, I was hoping I could learn, you know, something. Yeah. But he was like, oh, I'm sorry. He was like, you, you, know, you, are, you already have to know how to play something. We, we're not, you know, oh. we're not, we, we don't have time to really teach you how to play something. So I was thinking, all right. I walked away, you know, sad. But hang on at that <laughs> so time. To, but at that time yeah. you're playing the xylophone and, and single notes and on the around, piano. Yeah. Messing around on the piano. Yeah. Yeah. And so I said, okay, my dream of being a musician is, I don't know if it's going to happen. And so I get to high school <laughs> and I see these, these, uh, post, these posters are, are put up around school. Um, musicians desperately need it. You don't have to know how to play anything. And I go, ding, 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 ding. That's here's right. here's my like opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I go and I go and I go to the band director and he says, well, you know, we have a select amount of instruments, but what I really need is clarinet players. And I was like, oh, the clarinet. Mm -hmm. I was like, you don't, you know, how about the drums or the piano or something, something like that? Like, yeah, yeah. you know, cause I, I, I grew up listening to funk records as well. So yes, yeah. I was thinking, I don't hear any clarinet in, no. you know, Earth, Wind and Fire or the no. whole Ohio players. So <laughs> I didn't really want the clarinet. <laughs> and he goes, if you, I tell you what, if you take the clarinet, you play it in the marching band, you play it in the concert band mm -hmm. next year, you know, clarinet is very similar to the saxophone. Yes. And when I heard saxophone, I go, oh, mm -hmm. okay. oh, wow. He goes, yeah, it's a, you know, they're both considered woodwinds. I know they call saxophone brass, but with yeah. the reed and everything, you'll, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the fingering is similar, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. and so I, so I, I, I took the clarinet, started playing that. I, I just just it, just happy to be playing anything at that point. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I got in the band and the following year, I was like, okay, what about the saxophone? Because I'm ready to switch over now. Yeah. So he he gave the musical director gave me the sax. An alto? Take, alto alto saxophone. Yeah. Alto saxophone. Yep. He said, take it home. Uh if you, you know, you practice over the summer, you come back and you know how to play it. Yeah. You can join the jazz band. And I did it. I took it home. I practice every single day. My friends were mad at me. They're like, come on, you practice. I'm like, I got to practice every day and then I'll come out play. <laughs> Don't bother me. So, I, I so, got to get this. <laughs> so how old were you when you first had a saxophone in your hand? What age would you been then? 13. Was there instruments in your house? No instruments. And, and, and that's a good question too, because I've tried to like interview family members. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm like, there's no cousins, you know, my huh? siblings. Nobody plays 
they're into sports, but not yeah, they yeah. love like I, one thing I have to give my parents credit is that they I grew up in a household where they listened to great music. Yes. And so I learned about a lot of different types of songs and music because of my parents. Yeah. And no one, but no one sings. <laughs> it's kind of weird. No one yeah. plays any instruments. How did you develop as a musician on the saxophone? Tell us about that. Just um, basically being in the jazz band in high school. Um, that's pretty much where it started. And and the music, musical director at the time, he gave, how he started me on the instrument was he gave me a music book. He was like, here, take this, practice the scales, <laughs> learn the fingering from this book. Wow. He's like, practice makes perfect. And yes. so what I did was gather all the Grover Washington songs I could get. Yes. And I just listened to what Grover did. And so when you said my, you know, I sound a, yes. somewhat like Grover in some yeah. of the, uh, the areas yeah. in the song. Yes. He has a big influence on how I play. He, I figured, I think mean, Grover was like my teacher. Well, wow. You know, I, I call him my saxophone teacher. Yeah, not a bad teacher. <laughs> We're doing our best to improve saxophone relationships between Australia and America by nice. doing a collaboration together uh, of yeah, a Hall nice. and Oates classic. And people <laughs> actually get to see you play in your home studio. And everyone <laughs> I love who watches. Everyone I who watches it. that clip, there's you playing the alto sax with that classic Pamela Williams sound, but people can actually see that's really you. And, and, <laughs> and they can actually see that you're just you're just sort of winging it. You're just out there. Let's have a go at this. Not too sure what I'm going to play. Mm -hmm. and, to, and, mm -hmm. and to me, I think that's when music's at its best. I don't know about you. If I overthink it, I end up like, mm -hmm yesterday's stale sandwich you know i just sound <laughs> i might get it perfectly right yeah. i think yeah but yeah no nah. i do the same thing all the time this is yeah. why when i'm working on one track a single mm. it probably takes me longer than it should because i'm sitting there picking everything apart and then yeah. i think sometimes some of the best solos have been that first take oh 100 percent. it's when you're not 100%. thinking like, well you just said you're not thinking about it no nah. because if i started thinking about it yeah. i'm just going to pick it apart and I, I think a way to think of it, one of the ways I try to say to people about, you know, improvisation is simply like a conversation. If you and I overthought how the question and answers that we're going to ask each other, it's going to sound like, seriously, you know, I don't know, yeah. it's like watching the grass grow because yeah. there's no, there's no, there's <laughs> yes. no excitement about it. Part yes, of having so a conversation is sure. you're just shooting the breeze. What's, what, what's going to come out? Don't know. When you when you think about how you've learnt and 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 thank you Grover for being your virtual teacher, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> things like scales. Have you sat there and thought, oh, geez, I better learn what a you know F sharp harmonic minor scale is, or have you literally found your sounds on the saxophone more from the heart and the soul rather than the head? What? How have you? Mm. Where have you got that technique from? Yeah, that's a great question, and. So I gave you kind of my introduction was basically just reading, reading the scales, yes. the elementary book to learn yes. how to play the instrument yes. and then listening to Grover to learn things just by ear in his field. But uh, then came Charlie Parker oh. <laughs> and then those, when I heard, and you mentioned Phil Woods and those yes. at Cannonball, I absolutely, oh. yeah. I remember my grandfather used to listen to Cannonball Adderley and oh. I didn't, I wasn't a musician then, but I just, something about that music I just loved oh. and I loved his alto sax on, oh. on, on so many of his recordings. And so mm. I start because I had listened to some of that music. I loved jazz. I loved R and B. Mm. Um, I loved pop. I loved rock. I loved so many different types of music. So when I heard that and I heard Charlie Parker, I'm thinking, Oh my God, like, mm. what is he doing? So I went and I bought some Charlie Parker books where they transcribed his solo. Yes. And, so, and John Coltrane as well. Yes. So I was like, I've got to try to understand exactly yes. what's going on here because yes. it's phenomenal. Oh. And so what I would do, I became obsessed with just going mm. over Charlie Parker scales. And so, okay. yeah. And then I, then I found a book and I still have it. I, still, I won't get rid of my old music books. No. It was called Modal Studies for Saxophone. Okay. Yeah. So that was a whole different type of approach. Yes. Yeah. And so I did start you know, getting into those scales and learning yeah. what they meant in terms of how to play against certain chords on the piano. Yes. And so, and it's not easy to do it. It's no. not easy, especially when the tempo is really fast. You're like, yeah. Yeah. What, what, what are the notes I'm supposed to be playing in this section? <laughs> do you do a lot of the arrangements yourself? Yes. 
for other instruments. So when you hear those horn players and that, you've is that physically writing that out or are you verbalising those arrangements to the players? Just pretty much verbalising them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. We, yeah, we rarely use, I think in written recording music. sessions, we never see written we, we rarely use, yeah, we've, I don't think yeah. I've ever had a chart in the, the Isn't that for gig, interesting? For gigs, maybe when yeah. somebody's trying to learn the music, yeah. with, like keyboard player. I've had some keyboard players chart out some of the yeah. tracks for the other players to play. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in the studio, we just we just get in there, just and talk it out. Bite yeah. Ear. yeah. <laughs> talk it out. So yeah. you you <laughs> would well, that's a great thing because you would be a, a a great proponent for being able to verbalize ideas to other musicians. Like I'm in the same boat, you know, if I've got a drummer and I, I just want the, can, mate, can we start? Uh-huh. I'll just do that. Sing it out can, yeah. can you imagine yeah. thinking, oh, is that a demi semi quaver on the upbeat of four? You know, it, it would be horrendous to write it out and horrendous for the drummer to read. Oh, it. yeah. Sure. And then we're back to the stale old, because the drummer's too scared. Oh, you know, did I get right. that right? You know. Yeah, and you don't want them to be. You don't want them to be, have that stiff kind of. Yeah, yeah so even I, in live in a live situation, um, most of the time the musicians when we do when they do gigs with me, they mostly just learn all the stuff by ear. Yeah. I had a couple of I've had a couple of musicians who want the charts up there because they're like, look, I'm I'm not only playing for you, I'm playing for you know X, yeah. Y, and Z that's coming in next week. I've got to learn all this music, so it, give, yeah. give me a chart. Give and chart. so, yeah. Yeah. and I can understand how that helps you learn the basis of what the song is, but. I don't really like the charts on stage because I'm thinking, okay, use it as a learning tool. But it's a barrier. And then, yeah, but then I want you to play play by, yeah. you know, with heart and soul and just, because it's going to be spontaneous by the time we get to the gig. You're, yeah. you're going to learn the basics from the chart. Yes. But then it's going to go somewhere else live. And this is a really good segue to the next track I, I want to play for our audience. When did you first become aware of the song Me and Mrs. Jones? I love that song. Me too. Uh, growing up in Philadelphia, of course, Billy Paul is from Philadelphia. Yes. Um, Philadelphia International Records. They they were they were recording everybody. Um, yeah. Okay. I would say I was probably seven or eight or nine. And heard, heard that yeah. song. <laughs> yeah. Because it was I think it came out in the seventies or something. So yeah, I think it was. I fell in love yeah. with it when I first heard it. I loved it too. Even over here in Australia, you'd yeah. hear it on radio. And back in those mm-hmm. days in Australia, it was AM radio. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. you'd actually think, oh, I think I might have been 11 or something. And I'm just thinking, wow, who's that? Mm-hmm. What's uh-huh. the singing? The it's singing smooth. got me. And it's so yeah. smooth and that. It's smooth, yeah. And, and your, this may well be, I mean, you've actually forced me to change my list of favorite soprano tracks. <laughs> Oh, wow. I've, I've, okay. I've got a bone to pick with you. That <laughs> wow, okay. For, for many, many years, if someone asked me, well, soprano sax, who should I listen? You know, what's some examples? Okay, Branford Marsalis, um, Englishman in New York with Sting. Oh, I love how Branford plays a soprano sax yes, on that track. Yes. It's timeless. I know the what sound, you're talking about. Uh, and the yes, sound is absolutely wonderful. beautiful. You know, mm-hmm. what's another one, Brian? Tom Scott. From LA, the famous LA Express, Tom Scott, Desire, the title track of his mm. Desire. What a brilliant! Yes, I love it. Soprano. I have that. I love it. Oh, Absolutely. what his sound on soprano. And another yes, one, with, yeah. not so much on recording, but I had the chance as a young guy here, uh, the great English husband and wife team, Cleo Lane and John Dankworth, toured Australia, and I got to go to one of their concerts live, and it was the first time I ever saw a soprano sax being played live. So John Dankworth, who was traditionally an alto player, like you, mm-hmm. that was his instrument. But he had a funky band with him. And, and so he did all the normal stuff with his wife, Cleo. But he opened the show with this absolute groovy band. And he spent most of the time playing the, these funky tunes on the soprano. And his sound was just gorgeous. So that's my big three. But I'm adding... Me and Mrs. Jones, <laughs> okay, Pamela Williams that, to that. Listen, that's this, wonderful. this, that is wonderful. oh mate, this is <laughs> this is spectacular playing. And you know what's what, you know what's weird, Brian, is that yep. I initially I wasn't going to play that on soprano because I was thinking, oh my god, this sounds like an alto sax song. Yeah, and then I just I was in the studio one day just playing the melody. Yeah, well, I was like, it actually sounds really sweet on the soprano. That would be different. 
it it's what and and the interplay and this is another good example where you're alto playing it doesn't say it does not sound like you double track out i'll do the soprano i'll drop these out it actually sounds oh my god we've got two world-class we've got a world-class soprano player and her mate on alto has come in and that's what i that's a real compliment to you it doesn't sound Thank like you a double tracked recording but also on this recording there's absolutely wonderful arranging of what you're playing that's why i asked you the question you know were do you sit down and write these charts out so that when you are playing it that you know you say okay i've got to do this on that and that. uh i want to play this for the people now but this is this is up there with my all-time favorite tracks on saxophone this is just gorgeous so let's have a listen to you and your version of me and mrs jones Okay, Pamela, so the tone, the vibrato, the soprano is so delicate, it almost is vulnerable sounding, yet it's majestic. Tell us a bit about how you approach how you're going to play a song like that. How much do you think about it or does it just happen? You know, the choice of will I use a ebonite mouthpiece versus a metal mouthpiece on the soprano? Because I notice, am I right in saying that your equipment setups do occasionally change for the various songs you're playing? Pretty much for the soprano, I think at the time when I was recording a lot of my stuff around the time I did me and Mrs. Jones, I was using um, the same soprano mouthpiece. Yeah. Now the alto, I'll switch sometimes between a hard rubber and a metal, but mostly I'm loving the metal for the the alto too because it just you know I just got the one mouthpiece. It's a Dukoff, like the number nine. Oh, it gives me that edge. I still play that Duke, but you know, lately I've been wanting to change now. I think I'm I'm ready to do something different. Yeah. I think okay. I'm ready to try something different. So the soprano, you're playing a straight soprano, not a curved soprano? What's what yeah, straight with a straight neck or a curved neck? Curved neck. And you know what's weird? Yeah. <laughs> the mouthpiece that comes, it's a Yamaha. Yes. I was playing a Yamaha at the time. So the mouthpiece, I was playing the mouthpiece that came with the horn. Yes. And so 
I ended up saying, I should just, I shouldn't be playing this mouthpiece. I should go out and get like a more expensive mouthpiece. Yeah. So I went out mm-hmm. and I, well, I actually ordered all this stuff from, I think, musician's friend or, or, yep. or Brass and Woodwind. Brass and Woodwind. Yep. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to their, their website, but they sell yes. everything. Oh, yeah, I bought some <laughs> stuff from them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's just, yeah. 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 And I'd like, they'll send you mouthpieces so you can try them out and yeah. then you can send them back. So I go, yeah. you know, I feel like really like weird playing this mouthpiece that came with the horn it can't be the yeah. top of the line mouthpiece so i ordered no. all these different soprano mouthpieces i got some i got a fancy one that was really clear and transparent yeah, yeah. it looked really cool yeah, yeah. i hated them on it so i went so, back so to on the that, mouthpiece that came with the horn on that recording <laughs> of me and mrs jones that's the stock standard yamaha I'm on that the, stock. oh and i you know i played it to the point where it who got really cracked up and, and, and my manager looked <laughs> yeah. at me and said, you, you know, if someone saw you playing this, you, yeah. <laughs> you should be in par- She's like, you're playing the, the mouthpiece yeah. that came with the horn. Yeah. And so I ended up playing, I played it yeah. to the point where it was all busted. So yeah, I ended yeah. up getting, I think I ordered like a, a Myers mouthpiece. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. They yeah. have a hard, they're hard rubber, but they've got that nice little, yes. still you get the projection with a little smoother yes, yes. sound to it, I think. Do you think your sound, I'm just saying all of our sounds on an instrument are inherently us and over time, regardless of what equipment we use, as long as it's functioning, our sound goes with us? Or do you think equipment plays an enormous part in your end result signature sound? Can you tell us your thoughts on that? Mm, mm, I like that question too, because it's, I think it's a little bit of both, you know? Um, I think it's going to be, because I, I could pick up your horn yeah. and play yes. um, with your mouthpiece. And mm. it's going to still be my sound, I think. Mm. However, um, the things that may change may be the tonal uh, projection that you're getting from the horn. You know what I mean? And I know that with saxophones, they're pretty much the same fingering, but some of them, the fingering's different. Yes. Um, feels it different. Feels a little yeah. different. Yeah. Yes. So you you kind of have to get used to playing. Like if I if you're playing, I used to have a Selmer. Yeah. Alto. Once I got my Yamaha. Yep. It was some different. of the keys felt a little different, so I had mm. to kind of make that adjustment. But yeah, I kind of I, I think I lean more towards it's the player. Yeah. yeah and because I there's a there's a story if I can just yes a story, please a quick little story. Do it, a, yeah. As a matter of fact, I was reading it. I think it was something I saw on the internet it's about Charlie Parker. Mm. where so he was playing at a club across the street from where this guy was playing. He was not on his level or anything. He was just a guy mm. that was mm. across the street playing in another club. And Charlie mm. Parker went over there and needed, I think he needed to use his alto. He didn't have an alto for some Correct. reason at this yes. particular gig. I mm. don't know why Charlie mm. Parker wouldn't have his alto, but mm. he asked the guy, can I use yours? Mm. <laughs> and so he goes, are you kidding? Like, <laughs> Charlie God, Parker, God wants to play my sax. That's right. <laughs> God has just asked to borrow my sax. Is what the guys think. And so he gave yeah. him. He was like, "Absolutely, yeah. I'm honored that you yeah. even want to play it." Yeah. And he gave it to him, and he said, "Man, yeah. The, yeah. you know, I thought it was some special instrument Charlie was playing, but when he picked up my sax, it was like, yeah. wow." I've and there's a, a gr- there's a great alternate story. I, I've recently uh, read Phil Woods's last. Uh, biography, autobiography, and he tells a wonderful story in there that the opposite, that he was playing at a club on the left-hand side of the street and Charlie's playing over on a club on the right. In his break, he'd walk over the road and he saw Charlie Parker struggling on some you know, knocked up old baritone sax. Didn't even have an mm-hmm, alto. Mm-hmm, and and mm-hmm. Phil thought, oh, no. Went up to Charlie and said, I'm playing over the road. Do, do you, would you like me to go and get my alto and you can play it? And mm-hmm. Charlie, oh, that'd be great. And Phil was saying at this time of his wow. life, he was hating everything about his playing and his instrument. Wow. He hated, wow. he actually says it like, I didn't like my mouthpiece. I didn't mm-hmm. like uh, my reed. I hated my ligature. I didn't even like the instrument. I even hated the neck strap. He, Phil was so depressed with his playing. He mm-hmm. took all that over. Charlie played a set on that same set. I gave the sax back to Phil. And Phil said, same, I went same home. Thing. Love all, <laughs> love all of the aspects. I'm just going to go home and practice. That right. it, it just turned him around. That Charlie yeah. just sounded like Charlie on on Phil's exact <laughs> right, setup. right. This is and almost I, the same story. It, and it, apparently, he, right. apparently he was in different situations where, for yeah. some reason, he didn't have that alto. I can't imagine him without the alto sax. But 
Um, so I yeah, think, I think yeah. it's more, it's a little, little it's more the, the player, but then you're right. If you're, if you're playing on a horn that doesn't have really good action and the keys oh, are getting yeah. stuck or you're yeah. playing on a, yeah. on a reed that's not the right read for you it can think, really it can oh, mess you up too totally agree i think it's got to be a functioning instrument but i think also fundamentally i've seen many and i'm sure you have, i've seen many players with beautiful instruments not sounding good and yeah. I'm, I'm sort of thinking mate you've got you know top of the line yamaha well, sax. Sure, sure. they are brilliant instruments but you're sounding sure. really awful, right exactly you know? you're right the, the reverse can happen the reverse right. can happen yeah i used to have a um, coffee shop that was kind of like a Starbucks that had a stage, so it be all kinds of musicians that would right. come through. And a yeah. guy, he knew I was a saxophone player, and he he knew who I was, and he knew I owned the place. And he came in, and he said, "Can you give me like a tip on?" And he had a great, really expensive horn. He did like what mm. you said. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. tone, the tone mm. was not good. And he mm. was like, "What would be your one thing that you would tell me, like quickly? Can you, you know, give me a pointer that can help me?" And I yeah. said, "Okay, the first thing is you got to work on that tone." Yeah, I was like, you got to work on your tone because if you don't have a pretty tone on the sax, no one's going to want to hear anything you're playing. And I was like, exactly. so forget yeah. about I was like, you got to do the scales too, Sid, but you need to also add holding long notes. Just practice yeah. like one note mm. and hold it for as long as you can until mm. you run out of air. Yeah. And that's what's going to give you though, and do it on every note on the saxophone. Yeah, and That's going to give you that tone that you're looking for. And what great advice. I mean, I think, I think that's the perfect advice for all the wind instruments. Mm -hmm. I think I'd add in also, and we might talk about this a little later, but vocalizing what it is you're trying to play. Oh, if yeah. if you can, yes. you know, I'm a great believer of if you can sing it, you can play it within well, reason. Yeah. If yeah, you sure, want to go, you know, sure. if you want to go, ba -do -ba -boo -da -ba -do -ba, and you uh -huh. can sing it, well, your mind's <laughs> never going to accept second best with that. If your mind's heard you sing what you want to <laughs> yes. play and you pick right. up your horn and you're like dun, 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 dun. yeah you just sound <laughs> yeah. your mind you're not gonna hide you might yeah, sure. yourself. you're not gonna kid your mind you know? yeah. i want to move forward now to collaborations and and you've worked with some amazing people i was really surprised to learn that um gerald albright played bass so yeah, I, yes. over here in australia as a sax oftenest, i'm very familiar huge fan of gerald sax band love it you um, play on goodness. serendipity. Hello, you bring Gerald in on bass. On bass. How did that come about? <laughs> tell, tell us about okay. that because it opened up my ears as if, oh, OMG, this guy's yeah. not a one trick pony. This yes. guy's great. Yes. Tell us about He's that. Great. Tell us about it. Yeah. Okay, let's let's go back to um, 1980 something. I go to an Anita Baker concert. Okay. And I see a ba you know, bass player's grooving. Yeah. But next to the bass player, I see the saxophone. And I'm thinking, well, I don't see an extra person on stage. You're like, who's who's going to be playing that mm. sax? Where is this? Where is he? <laughs> so they fast forward. Anita does this track she does. It has this beautiful alto saxophone solo. And I see Gerald set the, set the bass over to the side, oh. pick up the alto sax. And I was like, wow. And when yeah. I heard the solo, Oh. I was blown away. I was like, who is this guy? Yeah. He's so proficient on bass. And then he blew me away on the oh, alto no. sax. Yeah, yeah. And so I think shortly after that, he came out with his solo album. And I was like, that's that guy that I yeah. saw with Anita Baker. And when I heard the album, I'm like, he is a phenomenal, he's phenomenal on sax. And oh, so and when you, yeah. you're right, you forget that he's this phenomenal bass player as well. Yeah. Well, I never knew uh, he was a bass player. Did, wow. Wouldn't have even thought about it because it's an unusual double, isn't it? You don't yeah. normally walk into the club with your bass and your sax. <laughs> that's, like right. that's right. Yeah. That's right. And so I, you know, I had, from that moment, I had known he was, I was like, if he's on tour back in Anita Baker as a bass player, you yeah. know. He's yeah, an exceptional oh. basis. And so yeah. Yeah. um I just always knew that about him. And so we were over the years, we've you know, we've been friends, we've yes. did shows together, we talked to each other on the phone every now and again. Yes. And and I always tell him, you know, I was you know, I'm one of your biggest fans, and you know, yeah. and he, he yeah. laughs about it. And so um so you invited I, um, him to to work with you on serendipity. Yes, and we did a song together before called Scarlet. And it was oh. on my A Days of Ecstasy okay. album. And okay. Yeah. He um he wrote the he I mean well he wrote the melody and I did yes. the background music and I said, hey, let's do this together. I'll yep. write maybe the chorus and how about if you 
to do the melodies. And so he did that. So he played, he came into the studio and did this killer tenor sax solo. Oh. Oh, he's, he's great. <laughs> but, like, but look, I'd like wow. to, uh, and, and this is one of the great things about the music mind, because mm -hmm. this podcast is all about, you know, as musicians, how, how does all this come together? And just think yeah, of that. Sure. Uh, I'm going to play a little bit of serendipity. I'm going to come in just a little bit before his bass solo, because it's okay. a killer bass solo in a is it, very, it is, it? in a very musician way. It's like, it's not necessarily Stanley Clark or someone showing you what you can do on the bass. It's just great. And how you Peaceful. respond to that on your saxophone is equally as great. It's it's because yeah, he, he saw me on we we were talking on Instagram, I think, one day. And he goes, Hey, you know, he's he's like Pam, if you ever want me to play bass on anything you're doing. And when I heard that, I said, I'm now gonna find said, something oh. to do. That's I said, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I do have a new single yeah. coming up and 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 I would this love for you to play bass on it. Oh, Absolutely. And, and the end result is this <laughs> single, I think, was your first number one on the Billboard Jazz Charts. Is that yes, right? It Serendipity? Was. Yes. Yes. Wow. Number one. <laughs> let's have a let's have I got a close list. before, but never this one was the number one. So what so what an achievement. What an achievement. And what a great track. Let's have a listen now. And for our listeners, okay. when you hear the bass solo, this is from a guy who is predominantly known as a great saxophonist. Here's okay. Serendipity. So absolutely fantastic, and congratulations on on number one on the Billboard Jazz Charts. You know Thank that's you. Thank you, that's Brian. fantastic. You know, I want to talk about now. You know, you subtly put on your website a little tag up the top. See my artwork. You just quietly put up there. Here's my music, and here's everything <laughs> else. And we were just talking about Gerald uh, Albright being this phenomenal bass player that the world probably has never thought of him as a bass player. Mate, your artwork is absolutely stunning those tell us about the history of your painting when did that start tell me about that that whole other side of your creative life yes it's um it started probably when i was about four years old <laughs> ah. um, my father was a was a great artist and he used to draw all the stuff all the time and show me and i started just picking up pencils and copying everything he was doing. Okay. And um, I remember him taking some some art classes. He he never did become an artist. He was just like, I'm not really into it like that. <laughs> so no. but yeah. he did take some, he did, he did take some college courses and he would bring home art materials and I would I would just go in and when he wasn't looking, I'd just swipe them out of his room. And uh, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. then he, he couldn't get mad because when he saw what I was doing with it, he was just like, Did you did you just did you draw this? Yeah. And I was like, Yeah. And so he was just amazed. So I I had to be like four years old, five years old. And I was I already I, I could always 
just draw anything I saw. Just pencil so, draw. Yeah. Yeah. Pencil draw. Pencil, yeah, yeah. pencil. Mm. and then I then I graduated to oil paint. And I wanted mm. anything, you know, every Christmas, everyone goes, well, what do you want for Christmas? I'm like, you guys all know, I just want art materials. Just, <laughs> I'm easy. Just, I'm happy with any kind of art materials you get me. That's, my mother was like, every year you want art materials. I'm like, I don't yes. think, I can't think of anything else. And so I just started doing it at a young age and I kept doing it so I've been a visual artist longer than I've been a musician yes and so it's and the work is that... the work is stunning you know it's 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 one of those it's almost a throwaway line on your website or oh, by the way you know if you want to have a look at some of my <laughs> paintings I, I just anyone who's watching this podcast go so your website is Pamela Williams the saxstress.com I'll yes. put all I'll, I'll put that mm-hmm. on our video so there's no one we'll miss that i want to play i want to combine a little bit of your art with a bit of your music here because you did a great song called one of the cats and this is definitely when you hear it this is one of the jazz cats there's no that we're not talking about the the pussy cats running around this is so (laughs) groovy and if there was ever a person who qualified to be one of the jazz cats love him or hate him it's miles davis I, i i don't think anyone could argue that there's the cat in jazz so what i want to do is as i will let our audience listen to a little bit of one of the cats and this is you stretching out a little bit the chord changes are more jazz for for want of a a word uh again you're on soprano as as a soprano feature here we go again Mm -hmm. but as the (laughs) and then you i think you Uh, yeah or some of the other senses yeah yeah. so Uh i just want to put up and i just want our audience to look at how stunningly brilliant you've got two paintings of miles one in a traditional playing mode where he's physically mm-hmm. playing the trumpet but the one that blows me away is where you've got him just holding the trumpet mm, okay, the, yes. uh, the attention <laughs> to detail there wouldn't be an artist in the world uh, who wouldn't be proud to say i painted that portrait of miles davis so i want to share that with our audience and listen to a little bit of one of the cats okay So, Pamela, what's your take on interpreting someone else's song as a, as an instrumentalist versus creating your own? Yeah, that it, it, that can be challenging because I think depending on what song you're doing, because um, I do a lot of covers of vocal songs too. So me yes. translating that to the sax, of course, is going to be a little bit different. And yes. so it's going to sound like my thing with my sound. But yes. Yet there's, there are times when you the melody's so great, you just want to stay with that melody, you know, whether it's a, a vocal or a cover of yes. another instrumentalist. Yes. Um, I got a chance to, and this is this is a nice thing to talk about. I, when I did my Burt Bacharach uh, yes. tribute CD, yes, there were those covers of great songs by Burt Bacharach. Absolutely. And Warwick. And yes. when I worked on that, I was like, I, okay, I want to do these songs that everyone's heard. They're old songs. But when I do them, I want them to have a modern feel yes. and a modern flavor. But yet I don't want to change it no. to the point where it's not recognizable. Mm. And so I was, the challenge was to get to do those songs, to make them me, 
to make them have my unique sound and to make them mm. sound modern and jazzy enough for them to play it on the radio. And so that was quite challenging because when I dug into it, it wasn't as easy as what I thought. Oh, and you do a brilliant <laughs> job of that. In fact, that's the perfect segue <laughs> because what I want to play next is your version of Alfie. Now, the whole mm. world's heard Alfie and all yes. of the world's greatest singers have sung it. And, mm. and when I actually saw that track, I thought, geez, I wonder what Pamela's going to do here because it's dangerous to mm. hack Stardust mm. and do a bash of Stardust because everyone's the greatest players in the world have played that. Have and the greatest, it, yes. the greatest singers in the world have certainly sung Alfie. And I was just doing, I did a little bit of research on the original recording of Alfie that the world really heard. It's an interesting story that Bert Bacharach took the Alfie charts that he'd written out the arrangement to London and mm. booked Scylla Black, who at that time, you know, this is going way back. But okay. she was like, she was the UK's top sort of singer. And George Martin, the Beatles producer, they recorded it at Abbey Road. So George was sort of, George uh, Martin was basically, that was his second home. I don't know whether George ever left Abbey Road. You know, he, wow. he had a bedroom there. <laughs> so George right. is there looking after the orchestra and, and trying to keep Bert under control. Okay, let's do another take. Bert said, let's do another take. So th this went on and George is sort of, George Martin sitting back there thinking, okay. When they got to take 28. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> 28 takes. Wow. The full orchestra and Scylla singing wow. it every time. And she was just uh -huh. saying, like, she was just saying, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm out of here. And it was mm. George Martin who saved it. He went up to Bert and more or less said, this is rubbish. The fourth mm -hmm. take, we're on mm -hmm. take 28. The mm -hmm. fourth take. She nailed it and the orchestra nailed it. He wow. just he just read the riot act to Bert Bert. Oh my Bert being Bert, <laughs> Bert said, let's let's do one more. And what the world heard, what we hear, if you go back, is the 29th take. Because Bert was looking for something as the producer and he didn't get it. And I think George Martin more or less saying, get it now or we're, yeah. all... <laughs> we're out. You're going to lose it. And I just wanted to say yeah. that to you that wow. I, I love your version of Alfie, but I bet you that's not your 29th take of it. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> when I heard you play this and we'll listen to a little bit of it now, Phil Woods come back in my mind because there's mm. some moments there I'm sort of thinking, what would Phil do? Now, Phil was an amazing bebop player, but some of the most beautiful pop solos, like if you listen to his solo on Just The Way You Are with Billy Joel, that is one of the world's magic alto solos. And they let Phil loose at the end. They finally let him off the road. He does some great <laughs> bebop playing. But you do a beautiful job of this. Let's listen to it now. We'll listen to a little bit of your take on Burt Bacharach's famous Alfie. Pamela, you've performed with some of the greatest singers in the business. Tell us about your time with Patti LaBelle. Tell us about that. How did that come about? What's your memories of working with Patti LaBelle? Oh, wow. Those are some exciting times. Um, well, you know, she, she's from Philadelphia. And yeah. Philadelphia is my hometown. 
And so I remember going to one of her concerts and I was sitting in the audience and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's phenomenal. Like, I need to get into that band. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know anyone. I don't, this mm-hmm. is, I'm just wish I'm dreaming here. And so this, a couple of years later, I happened to meet her keyboard player and he was doing some sessions for like a local singer or something. And so he goes, um, Pam, uh, Patty LaBelle's manager is managing this guy. You know, they think he's going to be like a, you know, upcoming singer. So we're going in the studio and record some tracks on him. Okay. They need sex. Would you come yeah. in and do the recording session? I was like, oh, absolutely. So yeah. I go to the session, play sax on it. You know, go back home. Phone rings maybe six months later. Hey, it's, you know, it's Nathaniel. Remember you came in and did the track? You know, he was like, um... Patty LaBelle wants a new band and she wants it to be a more integrated band with what she wants. She wants male and female singers. Mm-hmm. She wants it to be black musicians and white musicians. She wants this yep. to be a rainbow. He was like, yeah. I think you would be perfect. And she needs a saxophone player. And I'm thinking, <laughs> are you kidding? Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, a I'm a bit interested in and this. Yeah. So he goes, well, here's the rehearsal spot, you know, next Saturday. Yeah. Um, just come, I think you're going to get this gig. And so, and so when I, I, when I got there, I found out that they also needed, they were looking for guitar players. Since I had a friend of mine that was a great guitar player. And yeah. I called him up and I go, hey, listen, yeah. right before I went there, I was like, listen, I'm on my way to, we heard, yeah. to audition for Patty the Bell and word has it around town, yeah. they're looking for guitar players. Like, I'm coming to pick you up. He, he, thought, he thought I was playing a joke on him. He goes, stop playing a joke. Yeah. You're like, like, I was like, no, I'll be at your house in 45 yeah. minutes, yeah. hop in the car. So he, yeah. he says, okay, I'm going to go along with it. He's got his instrument. Mm. We, dr- we drive down there and it's, it's a rehearsal for Patty LaBelle. And, and two weeks later, we were on a plane going to Japan. Oh. And he goes, he yeah. goes, I thought you were, he goes, I can't believe we're on an airplane yeah. going to Japan with Patty LaBelle. So we ended up, both of us ended up getting the gig. Oh. And um, it was just like, a dream for me and I was like wow I can't really believe I'm going to Tokyo with Patty so that was my first show with her how, how many saxophones were in the band and the Japan tour uh, um, they, they didn't have any they didn't have any horn you, you so were they, it yeah you, was you it. Were they the all, one saxophone. yeah they wanted one sax player and I think it was myself and maybe just one other guy that they were auditioning yeah and so but you got I the gig I got as the, gig. the solo sax spot with Patty yes. LaBelle's band yeah what is it <laughs> what is it like you know standing there with Patty out the front, one of the world's greatest ever singers, mm-hmm. and knowing that in a minute, spotlight's going to be on you, and you got to mm-hmm. follow that. <laughs> what, oh it just, God. what is oh. that like? What is that Ner- feel like? You know, nerve wracking, nerve wracking. Because I, you know, when I by the, when we were going to do our first show, it was at a big arena, and it was yeah. just I had never been on a stage before like that. No, and I'm 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 in the room terrified. Like you can, the butterflies in my stomach are fluttering around. Mm. And so, um, Patty came in the dressing room and she said, "She said, are you you know are you nervous?" I was like, "Hell yeah, <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm behind you and I'm." Yeah. Oh. Uh, and so I I remember she just said, "Look, she had a." some cognac with her and she goes just take yeah. a little sip of this she's like it'll calm mm. your nerves down mm. and so i was like oh yeah this this, this is nice it's some yeah. a little bit more relaxed but still it was phenomenal and she was you're right she was bigger than life to me and i'm mm. thinking i'm i've got to come with it because i'm i'm on stage with one of the most dynamic and incredible vocalists in the world and, and so it and, was a yeah. it was a learning experience because um. i learned i learned how to um uh, play in between what she was doing because yes. I couldn't step on her toes too much. No. And it was challenging too because none of her music really had saxophone in it. None of it, it didn't have really any horns, a lot of her stuff. And so I had to make up like yeah. stuff as I went. Yeah. And have you seen the um there's a live video that we recorded at the Apollo in New York. Oh, I'm on the video. I'm on the video. Oh, you're on the Patty. video on that. I'll have to check yeah, that out. So check well, that out till then. Yeah. I get to check. I get a chance to come out. She always gave me a solo spot yes. in the show, which was incredible. And and so um she was really a powerhouse. And I did learn a lot by watching her. I learned how to, I mean, she could just grab the audience oh. just like and hold them there. Yeah, and then, yeah. you know, by the time, by the end of the concert, you felt like you went to like a church revival. Exactly. Was, yeah. I mean, the spiritual connection with 
with what she was doing in the band and the audience, it was just, it, it gave you chills. Oh, and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, congratulations to you for taking, for having the nerve to accept that gig, because sometimes when opportunity comes our way in life, we've got so much self-doubt that we talk ourselves out that we're not mm. good enough for it. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really impressed that you grabbed that, even though as scary as that must have been. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure <laughs> that, I'm sure that changed the next time you went on stage and 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 played, I'm sure you would have had a a whole new wave of confidence from that experience. Oh yeah, for sure. You know what for what sure. a what a and you know and rehearsals. The, the, I think the hardest part of the because I, I ended up being her band for eight years and we wow. toured. We toured a lot of those eight years. I mean, we yeah. were we would be on the road sometimes for five months at a time. Yes. Um, but the hardest part of the Baddie LaBelle gig was the rehearsals. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of okay. like we were like, we graduated from boot camp. The rehearsals is <laughs> the hard the bit. Yeah. We were like, yes, yeah. we can kind of, because there was no more like long rehearsals at that point. No. But, oh, my God. The, the two weeks before we went out on the road, it was grueling rehearsal schedule. Wow. And so by the time we hit the, I see why they did it that way. They're like, we want to get you guys. Match ready. fit. Got to be yeah. match fit. Because we're going to be doing. Game. A yeah. show every night at a different city yeah. it's going to be yeah. you know we've got to be on it and so the rehearsals were long and and mm. but when what they came up with at the end of it once we got to the show was polished everything was oh. perfect it was really phenomenal big time thing what about yeah. shifting gears what about tina marie now here in australia i'd never heard of tina marie and i know she passed away probably about a decade ago but you performed with her and also you you arranged the horns for some of her recordings i know the track i do want to play is a little bit of hit me where i live mm-hmm. and we also get to hear you play flute on this track yes which is is yeah. so you so <laughs> just for the record i mean you are a multiple threat across the boards i'm i'm, I'm still nervous about your painting career because i just think for most people they would be well and truly satisfied with able to do art like that but you just casually uh perform on the same bill as george benson and in patty labelle's man for eight years but you also play soprano alto and tenor flute and a little bit of keyboards is that correct mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. your flute playing on this is really great. Uh, its flute is very different, as you know, from the saxophone. And thank you. you know, not easy to play. Either. Not easy to play. <laughs> uh, you can, to me, you can almost. I always say to people, you can spot a, a fake on the flute within two notes. The saxophone, if you play a bit of a growl and you got at least the ability to play a blues scale, you might get mm-hmm. away for okay. A uh-huh. Before you work out that that person yeah. really doesn't know. But the flute, <laughs> it's the tone on the flute. You just there's nowhere to hide. So again, is this you working with that band no charts again or yeah yeah no charts um tina had you know she composed a lot of her own music too yeah and played keyboards and guitar and yes. so when they did the track they said well you know it's gotta you know we want you to do a saxophone solo on it but it's mm. it needs some horns on it and so i just mm. basically just took the track and just played it in the studio and just and then what i didn't write anything down it was just like okay yeah. Let me just record what I, my idea is. I'll record it. And then. But are there yeah, other. Trumpet, yeah, there's trumpet on it. There's a trumpet yeah. player on it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. We, um, I just basically gave him the recording and he listened yeah. to yeah. And what I played. And I said, I basically want you to just like double a lot of what I did. Most of yeah. the notes, I think, were in unison. And then we had some horn harmonies there. Yes. And so we just worked it out at the studio. So let's share with our audience yeah. just a little bit of Hit Me Where I Live. Okay. Yeah. Yo, Mick, remember that 
time we went to see Tahoe Barber. You had on that three-piece suit and the sprinkles went across your face. Girl, I loved you then, love you now. Big ups to you. You always. We've covered a lot of different styles of music. We've talked about playing with some of the biggest names in the industry. We've talked about you sitting in your beautiful home studio producing a world-class, and I mean it, recording with your latest release. What advice do you give, particularly for a young musician, maybe like you were at school, you know, Mm -hmm. thinking I love music? Um, but I'm not too sure how to get my foot in the door. There's the there's the absolute opposed concept of the fun of creating music, writing music, recording it, performing it. And there's the reality of the music business. If a young girl come up to you and just said, mm-hmm. hey, I love what you're doing, mm-hmm. can you give me some advice? What would your advice be? Well, first of all, you've got to master the instrument that, or your, whether it's your, vo- your voice whatever or piano, is. whatever you're doing, yeah. Yeah. you know, get, you know get, get great at it, you know, pr- yes. practice until you're, until you've got that mastered. And then um, also learn the business of music too. Cause it's a bit, like you said, it's a business. And yeah. this is a, I would say this is, you have a great moment in time where you can do all of these things right at your fingertips. Study, study, study all you can. Learn, yeah. learn, be proficient on your instrument or your voice or whatever it is you're doing mm. um, and learn how to navigate around computers so that you can record your own stuff because yeah, we, you can do it. It's like you can go in your own studio and create the music and not only can you create it, now you can, you can get into the business on your own. You have a computer and the internet. Yeah, you know, and and whatever you put into it is what you're going to get out of it, and so yes. you can market yourself now. You can just mm. social media, you know. Yes, <laughs> I mean, you can sell so, your music via the internet. So I assume when you write your compositions, that a lot of that's based from keyboard. In your case, is it? Yes. So so most of you, it is. Yeah, most of it <laughs> <Actually>. is. Yeah. <laughs> so would you say to someone, even though they might be absolutely laser focused on really becoming a great sax player would you also and i know you said learn computers but would you strongly suggest that they dabble at least in a chord oh, instrument to yeah, some level definitely and i, and yes. I you're right i shouldn't have left that out because you're right that that's the reason why i was able to write in my and i think it's always good to just you know some people don't want to write their own music some people can't no. But, no but then you have those the group of musicians who they absolutely do have that ear. Yeah. You're right. You have to learn how to play a chorded instrument. I mean, if you're gonna yeah. take if you're gonna take a college course as oh, a musician, yes. they're gonna make you they're gonna piano one on one is a requirement. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But people who are gonna watch this podcast and say, Wow, you know, Pamela is such a great musician. But Pamela didn't go to the college music course. Right. She learned in her own way. Much yeah. the same as your heroes do. One of the famous quotes I love, Stan gets, you know, I mentioned yeah. who comes from your hometown. Uh-huh. Herb Albert produced a recording for on AM Records for Stan Getz. And, and Stan at the end said to her, Thanks, Herb. That that's that was beautiful. Thank you for helping me with that. Can I help you with anything? And Herb said, Well, geez, I wouldn't mind a jazz lesson from you. Uh-huh. You know, you're one of the great yeah. improvisers of the thing. Yeah. And, Herb, and yeah. he says, shoot, great. Let's what do you want to know? And Herb yeah. says what you would think. He said, Well, I, I guess I would you recommend I start by learning to how to play a two, five progression in every key? And I love this. This is one of the moments in life. Stan says, what's a two, five progression. (laughs) And to me, I'm I'm sort of thinking, hello. Wow. Wow. And you know how Stan played the saxophone. (laughs) And Herb, and Herb just said, he sort of laughed and he said, I guess I've had my lesson. Okay. In other words, <laughs> that's not the way. Stan sort of saying, that's not the way that he would go. I spent a lot of time in my, my parents' basement. And I yeah. was, you know, practicing, practicing, practicing. Hmm. Um, and I just never gave up. And I know that there's a lot of people that may discourage you from doing it. But you just, if that's really what your dream is, just really stick to it. But then, be, but like what we talked about, the business of music is something yeah. you, you definitely need to know 
learn about because if you're going to want to make a living doing this yes you just need to know certain things before you get into that business you know as a as a woman as a female or a young girl just starting yeah. out on the instrument you're right yeah. i was the only female in the jazz band at the time and then yeah. and you do you get the comments and the stuff from the heckles from the guys in the band yeah but you have to like just just push past that and yeah. and if that's your passion to do something like that. You're, you're going to be great at it, no matter just what anyone it. else says in the outside world. Mm, mm. You, know, you just have to believe in yourself and say, hey, I'm doing this. You know, yeah. And I, when, I, when I first became a solo artist, I, by being on the road with Patty, I, I met a lot of industry people. Yes. And I remember talking to a few of them, like big, like big wigs that are like vice presidents of yeah. um yeah. I think so, she was on MCA records at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. and, and I'd say, well, how do you know how do I break into this business? You know, mm. I want to do a I love playing with Patty, but I really want to be a solo sax player. Yeah. And they, they they said, man, well, it's it's too hard. Like that this was the advice. It's too hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's hard. it's hard. Hey, George Howard at the time, they're like, it was hard breaking him into the business. He's like, and you know, basically you're a woman. It's yeah. And he and one of the one of the executives said, not a lot of people are going to be open about a female saxophone player. It's hard enough for us to market George Howard. So in other words, you might as well just hang it up, you know? And yeah. so I just I was angry, but at the same time, I kind of use that anger to fuel me to just say, "Yeah, I'm not going to just settle for that." I'm, you know, this, right. this is this is going to happen because right, I and can it feel has that this is what I'm supposed to be doing, and I this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, and so I'm not going to let I, anybody else discourage me. I, I think that's beautiful advice. It, it and uh, you know, Wynton Marsalis was asked a question, you know, something that was, you know, what's it like the jazz life, you know, being a professional jazz musician. And Winton's dad was a professional jazz musician who apparently lived a really almost destitute life, playing at clubs to two and three people because he oh, wow. he loved his music so much. And mm-hmm. Winton saw that. And, and, and apparently Winton one day said to his dad, I'm going to be a professional jazz musician. And, and his dad said to him, well, make sure you have nothing to fall back on. The opposite advice, because he said, if you're wow. going to, is it, that's the <laughs> oh, opposite. That's he, he, he just stared his son down and said, uh-huh. if you are going to be a professional jazz man, make sure you have absolutely nothing. Wow. nothing I don't think I've ever heard that. Before. Yeah, because I'm going to tell you, it takes a lot of dedication and it takes a lot of, uh, and, and it takes a lot of, like, because I, you know, I'm interested in starting, I have my own label. It's just me, but I, I hear other people that I'm, and I talk to them all the time and I'm like, yeah. you, you need to do a record. Like, when are you going to record an album? And they're, they've got the, they got the chops. Yes. They got the sound. Yes. Try getting them to really hone in on the confidence to do that project. And, and yeah. What you, yeah. You said something earlier where you mm. said sometimes people are afraid to get to a certain thing. So they kind of yes. like, hold themselves back it's them it's not it's not yes. everyone else shutting you out it's like no. i'm kind of afraid subconsciously to like really do this it's so like talk themselves i know out people of it. like that they talk yeah. themselves out of it because yeah. yeah. there's a couple people i'm still waiting for now i'm like hey mm. when you, let's do this I'm, I'm ready to go like i'd like to put out a record on you yeah and, exactly but you gotta have that the dedication the stamina yeah. and the i'm seeing this through to the end no matter what <laughs> If someone after this podcast says, I want to get buy some of those albums, where do you suggest you funnel those inquiries through? Right. You can go to, um, well, I can't say CD Baby anymore because I used to have a lot of my stuff there. But iTunes, iTunes has it, Amazon, iTunes, um, yeah. the www.pamelawilliamsthesaxtress.com. Yes. You can go there. Just go there and, and, um, and download it. Yep. I, love, I love teaching because I did get a chance. I'm just switching back over to art. I taught at a creative school in Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. Um, but I didn't teach music. I taught art. And I just, yeah. I do like seeing people start one place and then yes. just, I love that process. I like to see them. Yes. Just like when you, I heard you say that you only can draw stick figures. And yes. I was going to say, if I could, you've already got a creative, you're already a musician. So you've got that creative. I'll mind. send you, I'll send you a copy and of one so, of my stick I figures. You, I and, bet and, you I could teach you. Well, how to draw. I think you've got a bigger <laughs> challenge than you. <laughs> A bigger challenge than you might be thinking there. So just to finish on, before I play the collaboration video, which is a a great old tune called I Can't Go For That. I I remember (laughs) remember as a kid hearing that song. And how cool is that? Yes, oh, my God, yes. uh, I also want to finish with a, a great track of yours called Coast to Coast. It's just got a good vibe. It's got a, it's, it's you. It's that happiness. It's feel good music. Tell us a little bit about Coast to Coast. Well, how did that come about that track? Oh, that was, that was kind of my comeback track because, 
I had gotten out of, I think my last recording was that Christmas CD. Okay. Um, okay. 2013, I think. 2014. Okay. Yep. 2000, I think it came out in 2013. Yep. Hadn't recorded anything. And so okay. I, I was getting all these emails from people like, what, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> when are you coming out with something new? Why, why aren't you recording yeah. any new music? And, you yeah. know, I was yeah. like, well, I'm still playing live shows. I said, I just had to take care of some other things in life yeah. outside of music. Yes. And so it yeah. kind of got me away from the studio. Yeah. And so when it was time for me to, well, I was going to release a whole album and then the okay. pandemic happened. Oh. Yeah. yeah. 2020, I, I had like all these tracks done. I'm like, all yeah. right, this is my new album. Everybody's mm. been waiting. I'm going to do it. Then mm. I got scared and I said, mm. I can't really tour with it. So no, no. I'll just do a single. And so I yeah. called up my keyboard player who worked with um, Dave Coonard at Future Group Promotions. Okay. And I said, hey, I'm just going to put out a, you know, he says, just do a single. Everybody's just doing singles. That's all they're going to play on the radio. Anyway. They're going to they're gonna pick that one track on yeah. the CD. That's yeah. all they're going to play on smooth jazz stations. And yes. So yeah. I, um, Dave Coonard said, well, why don't you let me hook you up with this producer who, his name's Jacob Webb. Well, he's a bass player. Mm. He said he's got some hits on. I mean, he's really hitting now on Billboard and the charts. Oh, okay. He yeah. says, why don't you let him, you know, produce your your track for you, this track. Yeah. Um, you know, he says he's got a great production. He's and so I, I um, I said okay, have him send me some stuff. And so he sent me like three songs, and I picked, I picked that one. So this so it is did well. It went to number three, I think, on Billboard. So this is interesting. This is done with an external producer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Because mm -hmm. our listeners can sort of contrast. And mm -hmm. I mean, I can't hear the difference, which is great. Mm -hmm. But it's a different mm -hmm. working environment. Yeah, yeah. He he sent me the tracks. He yeah. said, I, I'm not going to, he's like, I already know, you know, you're a, you're a well-established saxophone player. Yeah. He's like, I'm just going to send you a basic melody, okay. <laughs> however you want to play and, it. Oh, great. Well, that's a good is, way to work, yeah. Is, yeah, like, I know it's, you know, you're going to send me back the track. And so he pretty much liked what I did on. Oh, it's a, it's a it's a great so, track. And we'll we'll yeah. go out with this one. Thanks so much for what you're doing in music, Pamela. You are an inspiration, particularly, I think, a, a, a huge missing chunk of the the world in music is the female side of music. Because from what I see over here in Australia, I'm sure it's in your thing, the school years, the girls will play in the bands, but as soon as they get out of school, 97% yeah. or 95 plus yeah. music's gone because they don't see any options for them. Right. Okay. You have, in yeah. your own humble way, knocked down some... You've created a path that shows, I think, particularly women, that it mm -hmm. is possible to do amazing things in in the brutal world of the music business. Because right. because <laughs> you play as good as yeah. anyone. You play as good Thank as you. anyone in your field. And I love how you're out there publicly and saying, "Hey, this is just me. Yeah. Follow me if you want to." I think there's a wonderful path there, and congratulations on that. Thanks for Why, taking thank part in the so podcast. Much. It's thank been a, it's been a lot of fun. This has been fun. I love it. The the video that we're playing on together is the first time I've actually done that in my studio. Everyone else is doing it. I haven't done it yet. So this is going to be oh, the first great. time I've done this. I think one of the the things I love about this podcast is it's one thing to talk about music and and I guess to mm -hmm. to play the the, the best of the best in a controlled yes. environment. But what yes. I'm the feedback I'm getting is people just love, <laughs> hello, here we go. We're just yeah, we're just at cool. home. We're gonna yeah, jam on it. a tune and let's just play. Yeah, I've had so much it. feedback and I love, I love it. it. It's it's the thing. Okay. Bye for now. Okay. Bye.